Hi everyone, welcome to lecture number four. So in the West, there are two main traditions that have historically informed Western thinking. We tapped into one last time, the Judeo-Christian tradition, but there's also the Greco-Roman tradition, the Greek and Roman thinkers. And today we're gonna to deal with that, and we're gonna deal with that uh, next lecture as well. And then the following one, we're gonna to pull together the Greek and Roman and Judeo-Christian thinking. And they do go together pretty well. In fact, they were united in sort of medieval thinking and scholastic thinking. And we're going to see how that works because as it turns out, it has big environmental implications because we're going to see again that in this other tradition, there's also the, the you know, separation of the physical and the metaphysical of nature and something that's imagined as beyond nature. So let's just jump right into the, uh, the lecture, the Prezi material, and we can see what I'm talking about. So here we are, we're, we're moving up through time, and we're also um, moving at, into the Mediterranean insofar as Greek culture is on the other side of the Mediterranean. So we're jumping out of Northern Africa, and then we're moving forward in time also. So let's just jump in to see this. Okay, so we'll talk first about Hesiod. So these are a number of important um, thinkers, that, and for our point of view, they, they all have something to say, at least the way I've, I've lined them up here environmentally. So Hesiod. Yeah, um, Hesiod, by the way, is a contemporary of Homer, more or less. So he's one of the older Greek thinkers, and he dates back, again, this thing where we have a culture that is sort of orally transmitted. And we're just getting into the point where it is being written down. So he's environmentally significant because he recounts two creation myths, both of which parallel the Genesis story. So we're coming out of the part of the world, Northern Africa, where some of these stories have sort of interconnected. They're not identical, but there, there are similarities, certainly. Um, and this case between the way he should imagine the creation of human beings and the Genesis account. And, and they all suggest, he should accounts as well as Genesis, that human beings once had this perfect relationship with the planet, that we lived in the locus aminus. Um, of course, we had that last time, and that means pleasant place, but Basically, it's an Eden-like place. So even though Hesiod isn't postulating Eden, that's a you know a, a Hebrew notion. It's very much like Eden. And what's the you know how is it characterized? This is where human beings lived at peace with themselves and the planet. So it's it's you know just to clarify, you know there are no wars going on here. There's no strife. There are no problems among human beings. And moreover. Human beings get along just fine with, you know, Mother Earth who takes care of them like a protecting mother. So same basic idea that we have in Christianity. So already you can see why in later thinkers, Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman thinking will be able to be joined up in certain ways because it, it has these characteristics in, in common. So in the second of the two stories, Hesiod suggests that there was once a golden race of mortal men. And they had all good things for the fruitful earth, unforced to bear them fruit abundantly. They dwelt in ease and peace upon their lands with many good things, rich in flocks. Um, not exactly like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but similar. You know, the earth unforced, you know, bear them fruit abundantly. They didn't have to practice agriculture. They didn't have to worry about how they were going to eat. The earth just sort of spontaneously gave them whatever they needed in abundance. So as a consequence, they dealt in ease. So remember, Adam has that um, consequence of the fall where he has to labor and labor hard to, to, to do basically agriculture to, to get from the earth what he needs. You don't need to do that here. You can live in ease, you know, um, without worrying about that and in peace. And note here that they have um, many good things like rich in flocks. So they, they had flocks of um, sheep. For the most part, the Greeks imagined that that's what older human cultures were like, that they were um, pasture-based cultures where, you know, everything was sort of based on having sheep and keeping them and all. And it's interesting, and we're going to see why when we get to, to pastoral pro proper with another Greek thinker, Theocritus. 
Um, note that they were rich in flocks, um, as we see. Theocritus will come next class. Um, is frequently portrayed as literally pastoral, and um, I won't let too much out of the bag. But it is interesting because with the deforestation, you have a problem, right? Once you clear cut a forest the way Gilgamesh did, then what do you do? How do you keep it in that state? In other words, if you don't want it to grow back into a forest, if you want to get use out of it, um, one of the best ways to do it is with sheep um, as a grazing animal. And they're actually better than cows. So having grown up on a farm, I can tell you the difference. Cows, when they um, graze on grass, will just eat the grass off the top. They're almost like a lawnmower that comes through. Sheep are different. Anything that comes up, whether it's grass, a weed, or whatever, they will rip it up. They will eat not only the top, but roots and all. So if you want like an effective way of, of keeping new growth from happening, graze, have sheep grazing on it. They are, they're better than any lawnmower. They will keep it down. And as a consequence, that becomes sort of a cornerstone agricultural practice for early Greek culture, where they did just that. And it's intriguing because they thought, you know, because they didn't really know anything about their own history, you know, beyond, you know, oral tales and all, that this is the original relationship that human beings have to the planet, that they were, you know, there with sheep. Little did they remember that, of course, in early times, and remember Gilgamesh is going back a couple thousand years now, the, their, their ancestors had actually deforested everything, and that's what put them in that position. They didn't know it, though. They thought that, you know, the grazing thing was, um, was the original human condition, which it wasn't. Yeah, um, you know, in Heshid, he talks about there being, you know, um, this golden age where everything was, was perfect. Then he is then in the Iron Age. So he goes through a number of like, you know, silver and bronze and all, but he is in his, his modern world, what it's modern for him, 2,700 years ago. And that is just like the biblical account, you know, people never rest from labor and sorrow. Everything is sorrow now. It's like after the fall, people have messed it up. There's no biblical fall here in the sense of original sin, but something has happened to transform the world. And it is characterized again again by labor. So you can see the similarities, these creation stories coming from the same part of the world. And if, you know, even though he should is talking about how, you know, people lived at peace with, you know, sheep and all with the planet, in his age, you know, his modern period, he sees nothing of that sort. The perfect relationship with the planet is already receding in the background. So, you know, it's the same case, right? When the Hebrew Bible was being written down, you know, Eden is imagined in the distant past. This golden, you know, um, age is imagined in the distant past. So it's not something that they have access to, and and he should, just like the people who wrote the, um, you know, it probably was multiple people who put down the story of uh, Genesis, even though historically it was always thought that Moses wrote it down, but I don't think most biblical historians believe that today. But in any event, whoever wrote it down, you know, imagined that that was all in the past now, that human beings no longer had a perfect relationship with the past. Not twenty, not 3,400 years ago when Genesis was written down, not 2,700 years ago when he should wrote it down. Already they, they saw themselves separated from nature in that way. Um, Prior to the account, and um, actually I'm calling it Golden Age, but but to be proper, he should refers to it as the Golden Race. Um, and Ovid, who we're going to get to and read his account, he's a Roman thinker that's going to come later, and he basically repeats yet again the same story, but um, he calls it the Golden Age. And we tend to call it the Golden Age now because of that. So if you happen to have seen the Woody Allen film Midnight in Paris, which is all about looking back at a Golden Age, um, that sort of pastoral, nostalgic projection. Um, that's really it. So um, he should tell us also the creation story of Pandora, who having both a shameless mind and a deceitful nature metaphorically stands for all women. So, you know, what ruined it here? You know, in the biblical account, we have Eve and original sin. Here we have Pandora who lets 
you know, the cat out of the bag, let's evil into the world. Again, it is a shameful, deceitful woman who does it. That's the problem. So with both of these creation stories, there is the justification for being, you know, a misogynistic culture. I mean, not just patriarchal, but misogynistic because women are seen as these shameful, deceitful creatures. So very problematic, right? And this is kind of where it begins in the West, both in the Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian traditions. Yeah. Um, so um, before Pandora released evil in the world, the tribes of men lived on earth remotely and free from ills and hard toil and heavy sickness. In other words, it's, it's expressly that women bring evil into the world. And before that, everything is fine. There's no labor. There's no, um, you know, illness. There's no sickness or heavy sickness. Everything is just great. Um, that is not the case in Hesiod's time um, as the transformation has happened. And again, the culprit here, the problem is uh, a woman who metaphorically stands for all women. So in original sin, it's not just that Eve did the bad thing, but in the tradition, it's assumed that all women pay, partake of the original sin that Eve did. So, and it's being expressed here too, that the very nature of women is imagined as being deceitful and, um, and shame, shameless. So it's enormously problematic, right? And of course, feminist critics, as you might imagine, have looked at this very carefully. And you know, gosh, you don't even have to look at it very carefully. It just sort of jumps out at you, the, um, the degree to which it is misogynistic and, and worrisome. Um, yep. So, both the Hesiod stories and the Genesis account, really multiple stories here, portray a perfect relationship with the earth now lost. What's surprising is that even today, you know, many people buy into this thinking that there was once a time when human beings lived at peace with the planet. You may believe that. Many people today do. But the question is, why do you believe that? If you look at the historical record, if you look at what we know from, you know, archaeology and all how human beings lived, there was never a time when human beings had it perfectly worked out. I mean, there were always problems, no matter how much we might look at a really, you know, how many times we look at a really interesting culture, we can see shortcomings there. And yet there's this belief that if you go back far enough, you will find people living at peace with the planet. Why do we think that? It's arguably a case because we've inherited this tradition that makes us want to think that. But if you think about it, even for a moment, I mean, now that we know about all the different cultures across the planet and all, so even if you could go back far enough to find this older culture, uh, just where is that? In other words, which culture is it? On which continent is it? At which point in time is it? You know, why would it be the case that all across the world with all these different cultures that they were all at peace with the planet? It, it, it just seems so improbable, and yet it is such a deeply held belief. And, and that's what makes, I would argue, what we're doing so interesting, because these beliefs live on, these ancient ideas in culture, and they're repeated all the time. And as a consequence, we, we believe them, even though there's, there's very little reason to actually you know, objectively believe them from what we know about the historical record. So it's a very intriguing thought because it means that, you know, we carry around ideas, ascribed ideas that we're not even sure where they come from or why we believe them. And yet we're just told to believe them, which we often do. So that's he should. So here's a big question. What is nature, right? This is, of course, in nature and the environment. We should know, uh, we should broach this. Uh, Raymond Williams, who's an environmental critic, mainly from back in the 70s, and he had a, quite a long career, remarked that what makes the question of what is nature so difficult is that maybe the most complicated, complex word in the English language is it included is it has many, many meanings and, and has accrued a lot. So there's an article written a little before Raymond Williams that identified over 64 separate um, distinct meanings for the word nature. Raymond Williams says, you know, it's there are only two or three words in the English language that are this complicated. And interestingly, according to Williams, one of the other ones is culture. So nature and culture have been invested with incredible meanings over the time. So to answer this question, we're asking what is nature? It's not an easy or simple question. 
And it's even complicated more um, because not only have we been influenced by Roman thinking, so the word nature comes from the Latin word natura, um, but also Greek thinking because the Greek word phusis, which also meant nature, has come to us as well. We know it as the word physical and everything related to that. And, and with natural, with nature and natural and sort of, you know, physical and all, there, there are a lot of derivative meanings too. And there's another one in the Western tradition, at least in English literature that we have to deal with in English thinking is kinda, which was sort of the homegrown word for nature in the British Isles. That also has come to us if you if you drop that vestigial e and there was this great vowel change where the y changed to i, that becomes our word kind. So it's not quite used in the sense of nature that we're using it today, but when you ask something like, you know, what kind of dog is that? You're asking what is the nature of that dog in a way. So there's a lot of history to the idea of nature. But we can break it down in pretty simple ways, which we're going to do here. Um, nature is often used environmentally as being synonymous with the environment, with landscape, and with wilderness, and in particular environments that are free of human habitation. This is an actual, actually a rather modern use of the word nature in terms of wilderness, and I would argue, I think I have argued, that it really comes on the scene in the summer of 1667, but it, we think of it that way when we say, I want to go experience nature. You know, you think I want to go someplace like wilderness. I want to go to Yosemite. That's where you experience nature and wilderness. And we often put those two together. We often think of, you know, landscapes as being nature, like a pristine landscape. But again, one that doesn't have human beings in the scene. And we often think of environment, at least we traditionally did, and hopefully it's changing now in the last couple of decades. But we often thought about, you know, save the environment. Environment, what did that mean? Well, it meant save wilderness and all. We really didn't think about save the environment of like heavily habitated areas like cities where people live. So these words can often be very mixed up. But keep in mind that these are very spatial. And let me explain that. Um, we, we see this, by the way, as what is natural and nature as being separate from human beings, that nature culture thing. We saw that right with the Epic of Gilgamesh, where what was inside the walls is culture and was seen as good, what outside the walls is nature. Um, that's going to appear, that dyad of nature and culture being separate, of human beings being separate from nature. That's going to appear again and again, especially in later Greek philosophical thinking, which we're going to be looking at directly. And again, that's very different than other traditions. And I mentioned, like, say, Buddhism, that's not the idea. The idea is that everything is deeply enmeshed and connected, that we're in nature and nature is in us. But here you can separate the two out, human beings and nature. So, yeah, if you think of nature as synonymous with environment or a wilderness, you're, you're mostly considering it spatially. What I mean by that, what is wilderness? A wilderness is someplace that you can go to. You can get in your car and drive to Yosemite, to a wilderness. Wilderness may not be here where you live, but you can go over to a wilderness. And in the sense of an environment, you can go to that environment. Or, or even if we talk about built environments and all, you can go there. So the distinction is between, you know, nature and, and culture, often spatial. And it was in Gilgamesh's time, right? What was outside the wall was nature. So you could literally travel to nature by walking through, you know, a door in the wall and go out to nature, just as you can drive to it today. And that, I would argue, is, is spatial. So in other words, you can't say that nature is here, generally with human beings, like in us and all the way you would with Buddhism, but you would have to say that it's someplace that exists that you can go to, which is separate from human beings. So the interesting thing is that the ancient Greeks did not generally conceive of na nature spatially, and their word for it would have been phusis. It was not spatial, but rather they understood it temporally. This is a really important idea, and it's, it's one that we have to kind of you know, grapple with a little because it's not intuitive. So let's, let's deal with how we can do that. And we can do that. Um, and why we're doing it is, you know, nature can be understood 
if you if you understand it temporally, it's going to be you know um, easier to understand what the Greeks were thinking. And to understand it temporally, I want to invoke uh, an artist uh, named Andy Goldsworthy, who's the subject of a documentary called Rivers and Tides. At one point in time, I used to actually show Rivers and Tides in the class. I'll try to actually put it up on the uh, the course, uh, Gaucho Space, Gaucho Cast, if you wanted to watch it. But I think he's it's an interesting way because he will allow us to visually see this idea of nature as temporal. And we could go about it other ways, but I think it's it's kind of the easiest way to do it and, and the most striking. So we're going to spend a little time with this. Why are we doing it? To reclaim this ancient notion of phusis, to to think of nature in a temporal rather than spatial sense. And this is actually going to help us understand what nature means to us today, even though generally with like nature and wilderness, we're thinking of it spatially. This meaning has lived on and is deeply entwined in Western thinking. Um, and again, it's this idea that's existed so long ago, and it's just, you know, um, echoing around for, for hundreds, thousands of years. So Andy Goldsworthy. Um, many of Goldsworthy's installations are like this. So this is actually an icicle that he has broken into little pieces and wrapped around a tree in order to make a sculpture. And it's to draw attention to the fact that nature is temporal. In other words, always emerging and decaying, always in flux. So if you think about why would someone do this, make a piece of art like this, because this thing is going to melt right away. In fact, you can see the sun on it right now is going to melt. And just to, to give a first pass of what Goldsworthy is doing, he wants to draw attention to the fact that all of nature is always in change. This looks like a, you know, it's a great piece of art, but this will not be there tomorrow. Why is he doing that? He wants to draw attention to the fact that nature is everywhere always changing. Let's, let's explore that in a little more detail. Um, think about it. If you make an installation like this, they, they make no attempt to hold off change, right? Rather, they draw attention to change and celebrate nature as endlessly changing. If, if Goldsworthy had wanted to make something to endure, he could have done that installation in like marble or granite or, or some sort of installation. That would look solid. That would look enduring. That would be something that, you know, seemingly can resist change in time. Goldsworthy does not want to resist change. He wants to draw attention to it and celebrate it. So it's an, it's an interesting artistic project because so many things, so many things that the Greeks did were designed to withstand change. But Goldsworthy utterly gives himself up to change. Um, there is a little bit of a uh, thing that has to be noted here. Um, if you are interested in um, Andy Goldsworth, if you go to the library, you'll find beautiful like coffee table books of his photographs. So he actually made that photograph that we saw of the icicle wrapped around a tree. And that's basically how he makes his money. He makes these photographs and he sells the photographs. So even though the installations may only last a few hours or a few days, he sort of makes them immortal in the, the photograph itself, which is, you know, when you think about it, problematic because it's doing the very thing that he's trying not to do, which is to, to make the installation endure. But, you know, the guy's got to make a living, I guess. Um, and the installations still themselves are always focused on this endless change happening. Um, another way of thinking about this, and this would be more in tune with the original Greeks, is to think of the installations as themselves emulating nature, like a blossoming rose, right? The rose is very much like that uh, icicle installation because you're seeing it at its perfect moment, the way that we conceive of perfection and beauty in the West. So in other words, it, you know, a few days before it was just the bud, there was no flower at all. Here it is in all its beauty, and in a few days, from now it's going to be decaying. This is what nature does. We tend not to think of it because we like to see, we think of roses like this at this particular moment, but all of it is the rose from the bud to the, to the decaying flower. And Goldsworthy wants to draw attention to that, the fact that everything is always changing, that even though it's emerging into beauty, that moment is, is, is also signaling that's going to go away. The Greeks were very fond of doing that too, the early Greeks. Um, and this is another installation that he did. This one actually shows in the film. Um, this moment 
is the perfect moment. This is the perfect rose moment, right? And why I say that is look how that's being backlit by the sun. I mean, that's a, that's a striking installation, if you want my opinion. Um, but And look how fragile that is, right? I mean, a good breeze might blow that thing down, but it doesn't have to because the sun is now going to do it. In other words, what makes that moment so beautiful and that installation so beautiful is that the sun is backlighting it, but that means the sun is already beginning to melt it. This thing will not last very long. And if you watch the film, you can you can see it here. Um, time is important because what we're talking about here is the process of you know becoming something and then falling away. This is not an endlessly enduring thing. This is something that is very, very transient. It's caught in time itself. Um, there, I'll give you some f further examples of Goldsworthy, um, where he draws attention to it. So he did this, was, which is this sort of stick installation that he's pinning together. And if you watch the film, he can't even get it finished because it's so fragile, it keeps falling apart. So it's, it's meant to be short-lived and all, but it's so short-lived it, it never actually gets completed. Here's another wonderful Andy Goldsworthy installation. Um, he lies down on some dry gravel when it rains. He stands up, and that's the installation. This is only, of course, going to last for how long? I don't know how, how much it was raining at the time, but how long could this last? A minute or two before that figure goes away. And, and this is Goldsworthy, right? This is, this, is, this is human beings in the environment that were there, and then were gone. This is, this is a... This is the story of, of all life. It's here and it's gone. Uh, he does another installation where he actually grinds up rocks and, and, um, and puts them in this little pool and then he gets some plants and material with it. And the idea is a stream is going to come by here and that beautiful you know thing that you're looking at is going to get spread down the stream and it will pass away like everything else. So I do a little more with Goldsworthy just to drive this idea home. I guess it's a lot more here. Um, he has installations that work at a different time frame. So like where he was lying down in a rain, that might have only lasted a minute of that. He has others that last longer, but still not that long. So this is a, um, a wall. You can kind of see it here. It's a serpentine wall. It's kind of like that... Um, Icicle, he likes this serpentine figure. And you might think, well, this is something that's actually going to last a long time, right? It's a stone wall and all. But Goldsworthy actually went to the trouble, and this is in, um, in New York State, of building this out of old walls that farmers had built a couple hundred years before that were now crumbling. So this wall looks great, but using that material, it's an acknowledgement that not, maybe not in a year, maybe not in 10 years, but this will crumble as the original walls that gave birth to it crumbled too. So a different time frame, somewhat longer time frame, but still, no matter what scale you want to use, whether it's, you know, hours, weeks, you know, decades, centuries, hundreds of thousands of years, everything will change. That's the, the nature of nature. Um, he loves making these kerns, which are the sort of beautiful egg-shaped um, things, but he doesn't build a foundation for them. He doesn't use mortar for them. So these will eventually collapse and go away too. But they are, of course, striking, but striking too because they're going to be going away. Um, He's not the only artist to do this. He's the one that's probably most uh, associated with this type of um, transient uh, landscape installations. But there are other people like um, Patrick Doherty. And this was actually back when I first got at UCSB in 2006. This was at the Santa Barbara Botanical Gardens. This was his installation. Um, and this was made out of willows and it was literally like woven together. And it was a wonderful building. It's, it's large enough that you could walk in. It's like a real like a house or something. But um, by the time, by within two years, the installation was beginning to fall apart and they actually had to uh, stop letting people go around it because they're afraid it might, you know, collapse when someone was inside of it. And it's long gone at this point, although it's a great botanical garden we have here. You should definitely visit it if you haven't. But just want to draw attention to the fact that there are plenty of artists, not only Goldsworthy, drawing attention to nature as change in the world. Um, this is another one of Dr. D's installations. Very striking. Same kind of idea, but in a different landscape. Yep. 
Um, so what's Goldsworthy doing here? In a way, he's answering our opening question for this section, which is what is nature? So what's Goldsworthy's answer to that? I mean, he doesn't come out and say it, but his installations definitely offer this up. And this is an important idea. Nature is birth, growth, and passing away. The endless process of process whereby everything everywhere is ever coming into and out of being. You could just say the word change, I guess, but this, um, I tried to, uh, I wrote this, so I tried to write it out to be as clear as possible. It's the fact that everything in nature is changing, whether it's a rose that, you know, um, blossoms for only two or three days, or a wall that only lasts for two, lasts for two or three hundred years. Everything is changing in nature. That is the, the signature characteristic of nature. So now we're very different, right, than the idea of spatial thing like to go to Yosemite and all, because this kind of nature is operating all around us all the time. And hey, including in us, because we too are in this process where we're between growth and passing away, birth and passing away, where we're existing for a moment and, and we're going to go away. So that's, that is the signature thing that is um, the original Greek idea of nature. So it's, it's intriguing. Um, other artists and Greek thinkers themselves created works that tried to stand against time. So even though this is the original notion of, of phusis, of nature, um, by the height of the um, you know, sort of golden age of Greek thinking, classical thinking, um, you have edif things like this being built that are designed to last for centuries. Well, they didn't. Uh, well, I guess they have in some sense. This is well over 2,000 years old, but but these things are now crumbling. So it's it's kind of like Goldsworthy's Wall, except instead of lasting two or 300 years, it lasts two or 3,000, but still it all succumbs to nature. It defiantly tried not to, at least not to look like it. Um, why it's important to us is that the notion of nature that first appears with the Greeks is articulated by someone like Heraclitus, and that is very similar to what Goldsworthy is talking about here. So all this that I told you, showed you with Goldsworthy, I wanted to do because one, because I think it's fun to look at the art and all, but two, this is setting you up for an understanding of how early Greek thinkers like Heraclitus understood nature. So let's jump right into Heraclitus, who you read. Heraclitus, you know, argued, and this, by the way, we, we don't have Heraclitus's books and all, so many um, ancient books were lost, but we know f some things that he said because they were quoted by other people, like Aristotle loves to quote earlier thinkers, so we have little snippets here and there, um, you know, because it's, it's going back so far, so it's, it's, it's very sad we don't have a lot of these works. Many of them did exist into, um, you know, the, um, the Christian era, uh, but were destroyed at the fire at, at Alexandria. Um, anyhow, his ma most famous point, which is what interests us the most, it's impossible to step twice into the same stream. And he believes, like Andy Goldsworthy, nature is endlessly streaming, wildly in flux, everywhere, everything is changing. So, he, you know, the notion is you put your foot in the stream, you take it out and you put it back in again, and already the stream has changed, right? The water that you stepped in is now downstream by on the 10 or 20 feet. So it's, you know, other people like Parmenides, another early Greek thinker, will say, yeah, but the stream's the same. But Heraclitus said, no, it's, it's not really the same stream. You can never step in the same one twice. And um, he has a student, Cretilus, student of Heraclitus, who's actually one of the teachers of Plato, who we're going to get to in a moment, who says, well, yeah, it's changing so quickly, you can't even step into the same stream once. In other words, while your foot's in there, it is already changing. It is, it is not even stable enough to say that your foot is in that same stream because the moment it went in to the moment it goes out, it's a different stream. So it's a, it's a fascinating idea. Yeah. And this is how it ties back into Goldsworthy. Like, you know, just like the stream, a rose, somewhat slower time frame, is something that doesn't last, right? You can never look at the same rose because if you look at it today and you go back tomorrow, that rose will be changed. If, you, if you've seen like roses, you know, um, blossoming and all, you know that 
you know, it can, it can change overnight. And that's the way nature is. Nature is always changing everything, including, again, human beings. We're, you know, we last a little longer than a rose, but we still, we don't last as long as a, as a stone wall. We have our, our moment in time and we live in time. So to Heraclitus, the Greek word phusis, and this is one of the original words in the Western tradition for nature, signaled endless flux and becoming. So to Heraclitus, nature is not temporal. It's not some place you can go visit. Nature is this characteristic of all being that it is always changing. and Everything is always going to change. So nature in that sense is not separate from us. So it's not like you can go to a wilderness place like Yosemite and you can go over to nature or we'd say like, I'm tired of being inside. I'm going to go out and walk around nature and go to a local park. It's not somewhere that's anywhere else. It is somewhere all around us and here. And even if you are isolated from everything, it is you. You are nature in this sense. Your nature is the same as all nature. It is temporal and, uh, and impermanent. So, um, there are other Greek thinkers like this, early Greek thinkers, you know, um, it's nature is ever happening everywhere. Um, to them, it would make, you know, less sense to talk about nature spatially than temporally. And, you know, Andy Goldsworthy is trying to do that to reveal nature as becoming, as emergence and passing away. And he keeps thinking of new creative ways of doing it. But at the end of the day, you know, Goldsworthy just has one basic message, which is the message that Heraclitus wants to get out, which is draw attention to nature as always changing. Um, other cultures believe this, by the way. So I'm going, I guess going to be my go-to example for today. Buddhism sees all life as change. Um, but that isn't a problem. That's a core belief in Buddhism. And the temporality of the world, the fact that everything is endless flux, that, that didn't go away. But in the West, this notion is going to be challenged and and basically rolled it over and modified so let's we'll talk about that when we, we'll get to plato directly um plato is writing just a generation or, or two after heraclitus so i mentioned you know there's actually just one guy in between them credulous who was heraclitus student plato's uh, teacher so they're very close in time but Plato would do something, Socrates and Plato together. Socrates was, um, sorry, um, um, yeah, so Plato was actually Credulous. Credulous was actually Plato's teacher, but Plato's primary, teach, primary teacher, as we know, is Socrates. And Plato and Socrates arguably deconstructed this notion of nature in the West and is stuck. And it forever changed the way nature is viewed. Because to them, it no longer signaled this process whereby everything is changing and emerging and passes away, but references that which never passes away and endures permanently. So I'll explain that in a moment, but just to take a first pass at it, true nature, according to Plato and Socrates, never changes. What we see, the changing world around us, is not true nature. So I'll explain how this works. It's a, it's a striking, and it is a deconstruction. It's perhaps one of the most important early deconstructions in the West, and it deconstructs Western thinking. So one last note. Um, for because nothing in nature is permanent, right? So if Socrates and Plato want to say, well, the true nature is permanent, how does that work? Because everything is changing, right? And we know it even on larger timescales. We look at the sun that's lasted billions of years. It too will one day, you know, go out. Um, nothing lasts there. So, so what do you do? You have to make this shift into a metaphysical way of thinking, a realm that is beyond the physical. And that's what Plato and Socrates do. So let's get to them. Uh, we're doing a kind of second hand by way of Abernathy, which is the, the guy that I anthologized in the reader. Um, early on, I actually had you read some Plato, the, some of the central books of the Republic and the, um, the dialogue, the Parmenides, which are very good. Um, but it just was a lot of reading to, to get to the basic point. So I wanted to give you an overview of Platonic thinking. So I, I just pulled a pretty random description of it from Abernathy, but I think it's useful and good. So, but the main thing is here is we're, we're trying to figure out what Plato was saying. 
So Plato knew full well that to the Greeks, phusis signaled flux, endless change, becoming, passing away. Um, he knew clearly what Heraclitus meant. He knew it better than us because he had access to Heraclitus' writings um, and he's one of his students. Um, you know, so he understands that fully well, but he doesn't want he, he wants to change that and he's not happy with it because he doesn't feel that this is a solid thing on which to build thinking as well as language itself. So let's, let's explain this a little more. Um, these guys, Socrates and Plato, argue that there must be something more than this ever-changing existence that we apprehend through sense experience. So sense experience, what I mean by that is everything you see, hear, smell, taste, whatever, um, this is always changing. And Socrates and, and Plato realized that that was the case, that there's no way you could challenge what Heraclitus said because nature is always changing. But they felt that there needed to be something more. And I'm not going to go into all the details why, but I'll give you an example. One of them is morality. So they felt that if there was to be justice in the world, you couldn't be constantly relativizing it. So in other words, it's not like, you know, justice one year is one thing and another year is another thing. It's not like justice in Athens would be justice, the same as justice. Um, it would have to be the same as justice in Sparta. They couldn't be different. So true justice had to be something that was transhistorical. That, that covered over long periods of time and that applied anywhere on the planet. So something like, you know, murder would be seen as an unjust thing regardless. So for them, for, for, for morality to work at all, you know, ethics to work, you needed this sort of independent reference point. They also believed it with things like beauty, which is another big idea for them, that, you know, beauty was a standard that, you know, everyone would know in every culture. Now, from our point of view, this may seem a little, um, well, it doesn't seem right, because we know that different cultures have different standards of beauty, and we know that across time, they, um, those standards change. Plato and Socrates didn't have access to the sort of multicultural background that we do, we do, and they didn't have really a good sense of history. So they they just wanted to believe that there was some, you know, solid thing that never changed. And let me go here. How did they do that? Well, they postulated a fixed and immutable realm called the realm of ideas. So you may have heard of Plato's theory of ideas, or sometimes we, we refer, reference it in the Greek itself, which is a day, theories of a day, which is this immutable realm where there are ideas that are free of change. They called it literally a metaphysical realm. Our word metaphysical comes from this period. And what it means is meta means beyond, beyond what phusis nature. So when you say metaphysical, really what you're saying is beyond nature. So that metaphysical realm, because it's beyond nature, which is, you know, characterized by endless change and flux, it can be free of change and flux. That's the way they imagined it. Um, is not, so the world of, that we know, the world of nature, everything accessible to us through sense experience is characterized by becoming. But the world that they imagined is characterized by being, where nothing ever changes. Everything just is. Is as it always was, will be as it always has been. So this is not something they believed because of religious conviction. They just believe that if you reason it through, for there to be things like, you know, morality and ideas and like justice that never change, if beauty is to never change, what would be the standard? What would be the, the thing that it's always pointing at? And they believed that there was a metaphysical entity that it was pointed at. So it's not a religious conviction. It's coming out of a philosophy. Um, yeah. So um, it's similar to metaphysical theology, though, right? So we see in like the Judeo-Christian tradition that an imagined realm there, there's an imagined realm which is heaven, which is separate and apart from this realm. No one on earth has ever gotten there. 
until after they've died. We don't have access to it, but that realm never changes. And, and that's a good thing in this thinking because you can be immortal if you, if you can, you know, uh, um, do the right things in this religion to get there. So you will have endless life. You will never die. You will never be diseased. Nothing like that <clears throat> will ever happen. That's the, that's the beauty of metaphysical thinking. So um, Socrates and Plato are doing something similar, but again, it's not because of religious conviction. It's not written in a text like the Bible that you believe is fact, but they reason that this must be the case. Then they do something altogether extraordinary. Um, they say that, and this is a deconstruction, what I mean by that, it inverts this sort of binary structure. They say that nature True nature is not this. It's not fusits. It's not what we know and see and believe in everything that we encounter. True nature is the metaphysical. That is the only true thing. Everything else is illusory. It is, it is changing. It is going to go away. It's in the same way that in Judeo-Christian thinking, the true human being is often imagined as the soul. Right? The body is going to go away, but you can still endure and you'll in fact live for eternity in heaven because that's the true you. So in this way of thinking, the true nature is not this, but is this metaphysical realm. That's a problem, though, and I'm not talking about Judeo-Christian thinking, but the, the Greek thinking, and it will become Greco-Roman thinking, because it means that the physical is seen as inferior. And Plato is very clear about this, as they are in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that this world is not the world. This world is something that if you actually believe that everything you know, when you go to Yosemite, if you think that's true nature, no, that's not true nature at all. You're being deceived that true nature is only something that can be reached. And in Plato and Socrates, you don't have to die. They believe that if you're, if you're smart enough and work hard enough like them, you can actually access it. So that's the idea. But you know, from our point of view, this is problematic, right? Because it is saying that nature is an inferior thing. So, we got a guy named Martin Heidegger here. Let me just start by saying Heidegger is not a nice guy. Heidegger is a philosopher in the really the first half of the 20th century. His big book, Sinon's um, Being in Time, comes out in 1927. Um, Heidegger was German and he was affiliated with the Nazis. In fact, he was actually appointed the director um, of university by the Nazis. So uh, he's not a nice guy, and the argument can certainly be made that he, you know, um, fraternized a little too well with the, the Nazis, even though he, he tried to um, resist them too. So I just want to frame it there. I'm not endorsing Martin Heidegger here in any way, um, but I do want to... to bring attention to him because he's really the first person to look carefully at Socrates and Plato and attempt to deconstruct it back again. He realized exactly what had happened, and it had taken centuries for people to realize this. For, for thousands of years, this deconstruction stuck, and everyone, and again, cooked with, you know, Judeo-Christian thinking and the belief in heaven and all, you know, everyone was in the mind that, yeah, this, this world is not the real world, this world we shouldn't care that much about. Heidegger he wasn't really the first. There were people before him, uh, Edmund Husserl, his teacher and mentor, and before them, people like um, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche and all. But Heidegger is the one who really specifically articulates the deconstruction. Yeah. And uh, Heidegger is quite a scholar, so he could read Greek and all. And he was aware that Fuss's originally signaled, in, you know, endless becoming, this idea of change, like Andy Goldsworthy drew attention to. And that, you know, um, that Socrates and Plato had reversed it. So Heidegger, through a very careful reading of the Western tradition, realized that that's what happened. Something big had happened with Socrates and Plato, and, and yet they became like the original Greek thinkers, the original thinkers in the West to a lot of people. And so many philosophers just got on board for that, in part because it, you know, um, reinforced what they believe from a religious point of view coming at it from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Yep. And Heidegger really does make the deconstruction uh, famous. To Heidegger, it, it marked a turning point in Western thinking by inaugurating what he calls a metaphysical, uh, a metaphysics of presence, which means privileging constant presence, like Plato's ideas. What I mean by constant presence, 
presences that never changed, right, that endured over time, that, that were not susceptible to the eradication by time. Um, and they privileged that over the original sense of nature, which is an endless play of absence and presence. So what I mean by that is, you know, the stream is here one second, it's present, it is gone the next, it is absent. Everything is absent and present. The rose is absent a few weeks ago, now it's a beautiful bloom, a few weeks from now it'll be absent again. Absence and presence is another way of defining what Fusus was to the Greeks. It means here today, gone tomorrow being here as a presence and not. But the Platonic ideas, the realm of the idea, the ideas, is a realm characterized by constant presence. So Heidegger thinks about that and makes a rather striking claim in an, in an essay, um, which I used to have on the um, uh, syllabus two, um, which was um, on the nature of technology, where he says that modern technology is trying to do the same thing. And he gives the example of a hydroelectric power plant being built into the Rhine River. And Heidegger is actually sort of an environmental protester saying we should not do this. So I want to talk about why that's important, because... Um, it is Heidegger's uh, assessment that this is uh, um, the way that modern technology works. So even though we were thinking about ancient Greek thinking, Heidegger is going to apply this as an assessment to technological modernity. And the way he does it, which is interesting, is going to sort of appeal right back to Heraclitus again and undo that deconstruction. So I'm being kind of ambiguous. Let me just jump in and, and, and do it. So recall to Heraclitus, his, his icon of absence and presence is a streaming stream. It's a near perfect metaphor for Fusus, right? As the stream is constantly in change. It is, it is, how else do you represent time? In other words, you can, I can sit here and talk about time. And it's very difficult to do, by the way. Immanuel Kant, philosopher, said it was probably the hardest thing to, to grapple with, which is the notion of time. And it may be right, which is all the more reason to, um, to appreciate Heraclitus, because he didn't have to do all those installations like Andy Goldsworth did to get the point across. He just says, there, river, that's it. That's, that's the best metaphor he can come up with for time. Um, you can never step in the same river twice, according to Heraclitus, because it's always changing. It's, it's a very good great, I think, metaphor for, for Fusus in time. So um, streams are also very good because they change over longer periods as well. So, you know, at times you will, we talked about this before um, in a previous lecture, but to say it here again, you know, at times the stream isn't a stream at all because if there's a drought, it goes away. And there are other times where it's not even recognizable as a stream. And if you're used to seeing that little thing going through the landscape and suddenly it's spread out as a huge flood covering, you know, acres and acres, you can't even see the stream there. So it's not only the streams, even a, a babbling brook, which is, you know, even when it's constant, is always changing. Streams have this other thing going on, which makes them an especially good representation of Fusus with respect to human beings, and I'll explain in a moment why, because they can wildly change. They can go out of existence altogether, like during, you know, a drought, and they can become unrecognizable. So in terms of Heidegger's words, they can actually become a complete absence, right? Absence of all water during a drought, or this sort of overwhelming everywhere presence, which they can be during a flood. So from the perspective of human beings living near a stream, you know, um, this can be, I say here, a frustrating situation, um, but it can be worse. It can be a deadly situation if you rely on the stream and if you're too close to the stream, because if it goes away during a drought, well, then, you know, you've you've lost your uh, your supply of water you've lost the ability to uh, to water your plants and everything and of course if you live too close and many people built you know towns villages next to streams it could it could wipe out everything with a huge flood so it can be a life-threatening danger so 
in this sense, human beings trying to adapt themselves to phusis has always kind of been a problem, if you think about it, um, because we would like everything to be the way that he should imagined it, the way that it was imagined in the, you know, the Old Testament in Genesis, where nature just gave us the right amount of everything all the time, where there was always the right fruit for us and we could get whatever we needed. But, you know, um, the, when you look at the historical record, most cultures didn't have that. There are some places, uh, true Mediterranean climates, like the, where the Greek Isles are situated, where it's very temperate all year long. And coincidentally, here in Santa Barbara, we're in another one of those uh, Mediterranean climates, even though we're not on the Mediterranean. But the climate is very similar. So you can have things here like fruit available all year long, or at least with something like strawberries. And having grown up on a farm, I know that most crops only have a relatively short growing season, like back east and in most of the world. World. And, you know, you're, you're lucky if you can grow everything in, in that growing season. Well, you know, here, something like strawberries, you can have literally like three different crops of strawberries because it's temperate enough all year long, even through the winter, to, to grow these plants, which is pretty remarkable. That's not the case for most things regarding nature for most of the planet. In other words, things only are present for a short period of time and then are absent like strawberries, like anything that you can grow over uh, in a short growing season, whether it's corn or tomatoes or whatever. So in that sense, you know, say tomatoes, tomatoes are only present for a couple months a year, maybe, and, and that's it. The other time they are absent. Everything is like that in nature. And that's kind of the problem for human beings, because if you're trying to connect up, in, um, if, you're if you're trying to live, basically, how do you adapt yourself to those sort of radical changes all the time? Um, we, we did, human beings did, and we did as early as Gilgamesh's time by realizing that we could preserve food that would last longer. So instead of just going from one seasonal crop to another, we realized there were certain things that would last um, for longer periods, like root vegetables can last for a long time. But the real great achievement, and this is why the great civilizations emerge out of this part of the world in Gilgamesh's time and before, is agriculture allowed us to start eating certain um, grains. And those grains could last for not only a year, not only months or, you know, they could last for multiple years. And in like, you know, Egyptian culture, we know that there are vast storehouses of grain so that even if there was a drought, it could last for, um, you know, multiple years, which is pretty astonishing. But again, the basic human problem here is how do you adapt to fusis? How do you adapt to constant change when everything is changing? And as a human being, you're, you're kind of, you know, at the whim of nature, basically. And that can be seen as a problem. So, Heidegger's a dam. So Heidegger, again, as sort of an environmental activist, is arguing that this hydroelectric power plant built into um, the Rhine is actually a, a technological response to our frustrating our frustration with inconsistency, like the streaming stream, because it actually converts the stream, in this case the river, large stream, into a reservoir, which no longer sporadically is flowing, but rather is on call for our use at any time. It's constantly presence. So what I mean by that, the stream is always streaming, right? You can never step in the same, same stream at once. Frustrating situation for human beings, right? For all the reasons we said, whether it's floods and all, or agriculturally, you just have short growing seasons and all. What if you could stop it? What if you could stop the streaming? And Heidegger argues that's exactly what this dam literally does. It stops it and it creates it into a vast tranquil, non-moving reservoir. And the water is stockpiled there for us whenever we needed it. So in other words, instead of being, you know, constantly going from absence to presence and all, it becomes technologically, it's made into a constant presence technologically so that we can, by just turning a valve, let it stream exactly the amount that we want. We don't have to worry about droughts because we have this. We don't have to worry about floods because the dam can stop those too. And Heidegger argues that this is like a near perfect icon for 
what we hope to do with nature. We hope to make nature fully controlled by us, constantly present. This, in Heidegger's thinking, is sort of the dream that Socrates and Plato had. They imagined this, you know, metaphysical realm. A dam is clearly a physical thing, but still it is putting an end to the constant play of absence and presence and making these things constantly present. Arguably, you know, uh, that's what's done with, I'll get to his student Hannah Arendt in uh, actually the same set here. Um, that's what's done with grain and all the, you know, arguably the, the Egyptians were doing the same thing. Heidegger argues that kind of what technology does at the end of the day, technology is sort of obsessed with putting an end to this play of absence and presence so that we can always have everything that we want present all the time. And if you think about it with something like, you know, um, agriculture, um, we've done that, right? You can go into your local supermarket 365 days a year and buy a banana, pretty fresh banana. You know, how is that possible? Well, that's been done technologically. We grow bananas at different parts of the world. So, you know, even when it's, you know, um, winter here, it is summer in other parts of the world. There are tropical regions where you can grow bananas. We can ship them either by train or um, either by boat or by, by airplane. You can get anything you want anytime. Heidegger argues that's the completion of metaphysics. Human beings in the original condition, we had to rely on Earth, you know, Mother Earth to supply things. And of course, if it didn't do it, we were, we were kind of screwed. But we're in control now. We control nature in that sense. Not nature in a spatial sense, but the temporal endless changing of nature we're fully in control of. And this assessment, which I'll get to directly, actually applies to the fossil fuel economy, which is bringing about, you know, our global climate crisis. <clears throat> yeah, so the idea here is the folks who built that dam, who in some sense made Plato's ancient dream of an entity free of the ravages of time and fusus. Is it really metaphysical? Is it like actually existing in somewhere like heaven? No. But in practical terms, it is far less an endless play of absence and presence and a, and a pretty constant presence as long as the dam is working. Unfortunately, we're seeing that in parts of the, the world now because of climate change and droughts where dams that originally could, could deal with smaller droughts <clears throat> are no longer able to do it because the droughts are just too big and too long and, and the whole reservoirs are drying up. But, you know, when they were working, they, they worked pretty well in this regard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just to, you know, to say this, I think, I guess for the third time now, it's, it's not literally a metaphysical entity, the reservoir, but it is metaphorically one. And, and in practical terms, it's, it's, it comes about as close as we're going to, to ending that constant flow of the stream. So again, Heraclitus is endlessly flowing stream, you know, called infusis that is now changed into a, a constant presence. And Heidegger, aims, Heidegger argues that's sort of across the board, the goal of technology. It's the same as having, you know, a banana available 365 days a year. It's all to make things constantly present. So it is kind of like if Andy Goldsworthy were to try to do the opposite with these installations and do what we talked about, you know, carve something out of marble to make it endure. It's a way of of putting an end to this constant change, right? So um, is the reservoir metaphysical? No, but like Andy Goldsworthy's insulation, if he had made one of these serpentine, you know, icicles out of marble, you could go back to it day after day after day, and you could be assured that it was always going to be there, probably through your whole lifetime. And in the scale of how humans encounter the world, that's about as good as we have, but, but it can go, you know, multiple generations, multiple lifetimes. So, um, Another example, and this is um, an important one, a really big one, would be fossil fuels. So solar energy is, is very powerful, you may, as you may know. Um, I forget the numbers, uh, but if you have one state in the U.S., like maybe Arizona or uh, Nevada that receives a lot of sun, pretty constant supply. Yeah, that's, that would supply all the power that the planet ever needs, uh, needs right now and probably for quite some time. Um, but the problem is, you know, the sun is sporadic. 
not out in space. I think nuclear, you know, fusion happening in the sun is pretty stable uh, for at least a few more billion years. But, you know, because we have, well, first night and day when the earth rotates away from the sun, then you have no sun at all. And if you're using it to like heat your home where it can get very cold at night, you would have a problem if you relied on that. And then even for longer periods of time, if you live in an area, not like Santa Barbara where it's sunny, you know, well over 300 days a year, but in most of the world where you have overcast days and all, if you had a house that was just heated by the sun and, and people have made solar, passive solar houses like that, it can present a problem if you don't have any sun for like seven days or so. So how do you deal with that, right? And in so many ways, like with um, power and energy, how do you deal with the vagaries of it? Another would be wind, wind turbines, right? Wind turbines are great when they're working, but they're, they stream, the wind streams just like Heraclitus is a stream. Sometimes it can slow down so much that you're getting virtually no electricity from the wind, time, wind turbine. Other times during a gale, it can be so much that if you don't design your wind turbine correctly, it can, it can break it or knock it down. So it's, it can be very difficult. And this is one of the reasons that renewables like solar and wind uh, never quite um, caught on the way you might have expected. So, you know, there were uh, water-powered factories, wind-powered factories and all um, in the early, beginning of the early so-called industrial revolution, but they were supplanted by fossil fuels. So, so why is that the case? <clears throat> you know, um, yeah, so this is the, the same thing I just laid out, that solar energy is, is just not something that you can rely on. In terms of Heidegger's uh, way of putting it, it is sometimes abundantly present sometimes too much. So um, some early passive solar houses had like vast walls of glass facing south, which were able to get a lot, of, you know, taking a lot of solar energy, which worked great on really cold days where you needed it a lot. But like in the summer and all, and, and even not even the summer, like in spring, they could easily become overpowered by the amount of sun and become unbearably hot to live in. So the sun is very much like um, solar energy is very much like Heraclitus' stream in this sense. But we have this thing we call fossil fuels, which are really, you know, fossilized solar energy. Um, and they're kind of like the dam, the reservoir that they can be stockpiled and held in reserve through lots of different technologies. So what do I mean by all this? How is this fossilized solar energy? Well, you know, um, sun comes down and the sun is of course what makes photosynthesis possible. I mean, you also need air and water and, and things like that and certain nutrients, but no solar energy, no, no fossil, no, no plants at all. Under certain circumstances, which were pretty common, you know, uh, um, you know 100 million years ago or so, um, these plants die and they do not decay because they would fall underwater where no aerobic decomposition could happen. And they ultimately became fossilized into things like, well, either in a gaseous form as methane, CH4, or um, in a liquid form in petroleum oil, or in a solid form like coal. So in a way, this, this was all made possible by solar energy. Solar energy, you know, created that power. And it was absorbed by plants, and then they ultimately were fossilized into this material that has an advantage that you can burn it any time. So even though the sun was shining, you know, sporadically on these plants 100 million years ago, um, now because their, their remains, their bodies have been fossilized, you can dig up, you know, um, you, you know, oil and put it in your car, refined oil in the form of gasoline, and you can turn your car on, you know, 365 days a year whenever you want, uh, because it's all based on combustion. Our whole fossil fuel economy is based on combustion. And what that means is you, you don't have to worry about the sun being absent and present because as long as we have these fossil fuels present and we have had them present 
for at least a couple hundred years, in some cases 400 years, um, it means that they are available at any time. Kind of like Heidegger's Dam, right? So that, you know, you can let out just as much water as you need at any time. You can burn just as much gasoline as you need. You can do it very carefully. In fact, we all do it. Or if you drive a car, you do. You know, just by putting the throttle down, you can decide how much gasoline is burned, how fast you want to go at any given time. It's, it's really extraordinary. Um, it didn't used to be that, right? Right. So if you had to rely on something like wind, which is also solar energy, by the way, right? The, the sun beats down on different parts of the world. And because there's different source and sink of energy, you know, moves from one place to another and causes wind. Well, if you wanted to get around, you know, as people did for, for many hundreds of years um, on the ocean, sailboats did just that. But you had to rely on the wind, which is a tricky business. If you were, you know, out in the middle of some ocean where there were doldrums and there wasn't much, you know, wind, you had a problem. You couldn't get anywhere. Um, as a consequence, we don't bother with that anymore. We ship enormous amounts of material across the planet by way of the oceans, but we do it powered by fossil fuels, principally oil. It's a very, very environmentally problematic oil called bunker oil. Um, but it's still, it's fossilized, you know, um, solar energy is what it really is. Heidegger argues that you know, this is really the completion of the dream that Socrates and Aristotle had for constant presence. You know, it's not, you know, oil is not a metaphysical presence, but just like the reservoir, it is something that is constantly present. And that's what we human beings like. We don't want to be at the whim of nature. We don't want to have to worry if there's going to be a breeze to get us around. Uh, in our culture now, we want to get any, we want everything just the way we want it. We don't want houses that are heated by solar or energy that might be a little colder one day and a little warmer one day. We want to go set our thermostat at 72 degrees and we want that temperature to be exactly that within a degree all the time. And Heidegger argues, well, this is, this is kind of a problem. And if you think about it, it's a huge problem because it's what's bringing about the climate crisis because even though we have this abundant supply of energy, either direct solar energy, you know, which you can use to heat a house or indirect by way of wind, which can turn wind turbines or, you know, move sailing ships, we're not satisfied with that. We want it always present all the time. And, and this presents a huge problem and it's, it's brought about the climate crisis because if we would have adapted ourselves to, you know, energy sources that were they're sort of caught in the play of absence and presence, um, we wouldn't have these problems uh, now, but, but we do. Um, in this sense, our love of fossil fuels is metaphysical, a frustration with fusus. We don't, we don't want to wait for anything. We want everything just when we want it, the way we want it. And as a consequence, that's how we, we power our world. Um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating way of looking at it that Heidegger is putting forth here. Um, he argued that not only are so-called natural resources being stockpiled, but he goes further to say that we are so caught up with this that we now do the same with human beings. We're not natural resources, they're human resources. Heidegger calls this um, Bestand, which is a German for constant presence. That um, we've not only done this with the natural world, so that we have everything present whenever we want it, whether it's by fossil fuels or ultimately by fossil fuels, bringing things like bananas to us and all, but with human beings too, right? So we're in little cubicles and we're deployed as needed and people and factories are there, constantly there all the time to do work. This is the way our culture is. We, we, we just don't open ourselves up to the, sort of the flow of nature. And, you know, what would that mean? Well, hey, let's say like doing something like your clothing and all, doing laundry. If you're drying laundry, we throw it in a dryer, we dry it, and we're done in an hour. Well, traditional cultures all over the planet, you know, they hung a line out. Environmentally, it's a great idea. And you could only heat, you can only dry your clothes on a sunny day or maybe light breezes, but not too much. So, you know, you would have to adapt yourself to the environment when you're doing your laundry rather than the other way around, which is what we do now. Um, and again, office workers in cubicles are a good example of, um, 
of natural resources turned into human resources. Um, Heidegger had a student, Hannah Arendt, um, arguably the, the more interesting thinker of the bunch, um, realized that this had been happening, this quest for constant presence for thousands of years. And an example would be um, the very way that Gilgamesh's culture comes into being, which again is based, uh, building an economy based on grain, as opposed to, you know, just harvesting things when they are available, um, you know, in the environment. Um, so, you know, like strawberries when they're, they're ripe and all. So that's the basic idea here. It's a, um, it's, it's a pretty striking way of thinking about the world, but just I wanted you to be clear on on what phusis is, what nature was to the Greeks, because it is this temporal rather than a spatial thing, and why that could matter, because if we think about nature again in that way, we realize that that we have always been frustrated with nature in that sense. And Socrates and Plato certainly were, which is why they came up with this metaphysical philosophy. But, you know, as a culture, the way we, um, uh, you know, adapt ourselves to nature is that we don't adapt ourselves to nature. We found a way of making nature in, in, in every way possible, if we can, constantly present. So we're in control of, it, control of it all so that we can have whatever we want, whenever we want. That's great for us. You can see why we went about it and did it. But on the other hand, this has enormous consequences for the planet, especially as this was largely facilitated through uh, an economy that made energy constantly present, which is the fossil fuel economy that we have today. So we're going to address this more as we go along, but I just wanted to, uh, to get you thinking about some of the larger implications of, of old, obscure, and pretty ancient early um, Greek thinking. Okay, so next time we're going to continue with Greek thinking in a somewhat different vein. So take care.